Well, hello there, everybody. We are doing another Titan U course on weather models. Today, we're going to talk about the different types of weather models. If you haven't done so already, I did a lesson on the Hitchhiker's Guide to Weather Models, which was an introductory kind of a course, which I guess covers the overview of weather models, what you want to be looking for, uh, that sort of thing. These are geared towards storm chasers and storm spotters. These aren't a meteorology class, so to speak, more of a chasing, hands-on, practical thing for chasers or spotters or just weather enthusiasts who want to know a little bit more about weather models. But we don't dive too far into the science behind them. There's a lot to discuss there, and we could have hours of uh, material on that specifically. So with that said, let's just get this thing started. Today's lesson is on the different types of weather models. We're going to kind of differentiate what's an ensemble, what's high res, what's low res, what's long range, mid range, and then talk about how to use each different type for the, what they do best. So with that in mind, let's click to the next slide. Okay, well, to get us started, there is more than one type of weather model. I know it's crazy, but it's true. If you didn't know that, there you go. Now you know, and your mind is blown. Models are going to all use different formulas. They all have different strengths and weaknesses. You know, some models are going to do better with severe weather. Some are going to do better with tropics. Some are going to do better with winter weather. It's just how it goes. That will be something in terms of severe weather and storm chasing we probably get into in a future lesson. But just know that they all do things better than others, that sort of thing. Models also run at different resolutions. They run out to different times in the future. Not all models are made the same. For instance, the GFS, which you can see a screenshot of here, runs out to 384 hours, runs at a resolution of 12 kilometers. You have the NAM 3 kilometer, which runs out to 60 hours and is, of course, at 3 kilometer resolution. So you can get quite a range. A general rule, the less resolution a model has, so basically if it's a 12 or 9 kilometer model, it'll run further out into the future, 10 to 15 days or so, just so you know. So less resolution the longer they can usually go because the computing power to compute a three kilometer model at 15 days out would be immense. But anyways, there you go. So for chasers, we're going to simplify this. This is not an official classification of the three different types of models, but it is what we're going to do today uh, just for chasing purposes. Type one, we have the short range high resolution models. These are going to be more often used on the day of an event. You will see individual storms with these, etc. The second type are medium and long range models. They're lower resolution, but you use these to forecast out days in advance. So you know, hey, a week from now, we'll probably be chasing somewhere like Kansas, Oklahoma, etc. And then you have type three, which are ensembles, which are either short or long term and can be used. I generally use them as a supplement, but they paint broader strokes and allow you to kind of see what the probabilities are of something happening, that sort of thing. We'll get into some ensembles here in a bit. So let's actually start. That's actually the, what we're talking about next is ensembles. So mid and long term ensembles, you have the GEFS and the EPS are two good examples. Ensembles, the basic explainer for what an ensemble is, they're the average of many models put into one. So the GEFS, basically there's different uh, calculations, small calculations that run, and it runs you know, 20 times, and you get an average of all 20 for the model, but you can also see individual members, like you can see pictured here. They're really good for painting with broader strokes. And I'm talking about things like, not that, hey, there's definitely gonna be a chase day in Kansas on Saturday, but more along the lines of, above normal temperatures next week with above normal precip. This is an active storm pattern. It's, you know, this is good. For chase use, especially this time of year, you know, if you see a lot of precip being generated and there's a lot of moisture they're pumping up, you, you know, you can see the basic ingredients for severe weathers there. And that's what you know, you know, eight to 14 days in advance. Those conditions are all going to be in place. It looks like there's going to be rain but it's going to take time to narrow it down. But you kind of got a general idea that, hey, we could be chasing next week, and that's good. But these aren't for targeting a specific area days away. You don't want to sit down and look at the GEFS and look two weeks from now and say, we're going to be in Kansas on April 2nd, and we are chasing that day for sure. <laughs> you may or you may not. They do change. So I like ensembles for painting broad strokes in the longer term. That's, you know, that's just how that works. So let's take a look at our next ensemble. 
and this one's the href. Uh, this is new to 2018. They, uh, the Storm Prediction Center, uh, created this. It's an average of several different high-resolution short-term models. So things like the NOM three kilometer, various WERFs, etc. And it uses their data and aggregate to form what is essentially a picture of what each of them are saying, either an average, you can see a probability type of table, or you can see them all overlaid. There's a lot of uses for this. The thing I am finding that I like most about this model is seeing things like where are models pumping out precip, especially on like a dry line day where you're expecting isolated storms. Where, where all are storms actually being forecast by this model? And the other thing I'm really liking is things like the ensemble, uh, eight, uh, excuse me, holistic tracks, updraft holistic tracks, which kind of lets you see where are storms pumping, where are these models pumping out storms that tend to be rotating, that sort of thing. It's very cool. I haven't fully played with this yet for storm season, and I, ha you know, we're, we're going to see how it works. But I'm really excited because I think it has potential. If it's going to be anything like I think, I think it's going to be an essential part of the old toolkit. Also, you have the SRAF, which we'll talk about. Uh, the SRAF, uh, we'll go back to that slide here in a second, is one of those models that I've been using for a while. I love the ensemble look. So let's talk about that SRAF. The SRAF, it's like the HRAF, or the HRAF is technically like the SRAF. It's older, and it's been used a little longer. It's It goes up to 87 hours in advance, which is about three and a half days, and it combines several short and midterm models for its output. A good classic chase use example for this. What would you use the SREF for? This is one example. You know, you're looking out three days in advance. You say, you know, the moisture's look questionable on the GFS. It's look questionable on the NUM. What does the SREF say? Are we going to get 60 dew points up in the southwest Oklahoma? What are the probabilities it's putting out for that? And you kind of get a good idea. You know, it could get if you're getting something like 75, 80%, you can say we're getting 60 dew points. But if you're getting something closer to like 40 or 50%, you can say it's a little bit more questionable. The SRAF's really good for kind of seeing when there's model disagreements in that medium term uh, period where one model's showing really good moisture and one's not, what they're saying in aggregate. It's really useful in those situations where there's a lot of disagreement, even a couple of days in advance, which surprisingly happens more than you think. So I'm a huge fan of the SRAF when it comes to that. Now, the mid and long term models, we're talking about the operational ones now, not the ensembles. So we're talking about single runs of models. These include things like the Euro, the GFS, and the NAM. They run a resolution somewhere between 9 and 12 kilometers. So that allows them to model a little bit more than storm scale. So they're not modeling individual storms, but they do run uh, several days in the future. The GFS, for instance, 15 days into the future. So you can kind of get a good broad overview of what a setup may look like, especially in that week range from now. Uh, I don't usually take storm systems very serious until they get a weekend or so. But the longer from now you get, obviously, this is an obvious point, the less reliable data is on these. The 384-hour GFS is not an expectation of weather conditions 15 and 16 days out. It's not, you don't take it literally. Honestly, if the 384 hour GFS were accurate, we would live in an uninhabitable planet. Uninhabitable planet. There, I said it right the second time. So, you know, don't take it too seriously uh, that far in advance. Again, I prefer ensembles to paint with broader strokes at that point. These are very general for getting, uh, helpful for getting general ideas for what a setup might entail, but the big thing to remember is that data is going to change a lot from day seven to day one. There's a lot of reasons for that. We're going to touch on the main one in a little bit. But just remember that these are good for broad strokes. But don't sit there and say, oh, yeah, this is definitely going to be exactly how it happens. Uh, in general, as a general practice, uh, don't expect a setup to get a lot better going into an event. It's very rare for a setup to look just amazing at day seven, and it looks even better better by day one. It's very rare for that to happen. The more general trend is for a day to look amazing and then good or super amazing and then just amazing. So don't, it's very rare for models to go upwards in trajectory on an event. For whatever reason, they have a bias in the later stages to producing bigger days 
before it, you get down to day one, which it's just not that big. So as the data clears up, as you get more in detail, typically days get worse as you get closer. So when you see me talking down about a day seven days out, it's because it only looks good and the odds of it being anything worth chasing by the day of, especially in the early parts of the season, not that great. Forecast soundings are another thing you can use on these models. The GFS, the NAM, etc. They have forecast soundings you can use. These give you a good 3D picture of what the model is painting. I like going to these. Uh, I mean, in all honesty, if I'm lazy, I will pull up Supercell Composite or Cape, and I will click where it looks like I would want to target. And then I look at a sounding just to see, and this is, you know, seven, eight days. And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, that could be a pretty interesting day. If I'm wanting to be lazy, that's what I do. Uh, because honestly, there's not much, there's no reason to put a lot of effort into a day, seven and eight days out as a storm chaser. You, it's a long way out there. There's nothing you're going to be able to decide eight days from now that you can't decide as you get more models and higher resolution models two and three days in advance. So uh, just take the data seriously, but don't take it literally. Expect changes. Sometimes you're going to get wholesale changes. And also, if skew tees confuse you, we have an amazing course on skew tees, and we're going to have another course very soon on other aspects of sounding. So stay tuned for that, but check out the skew tee course. I may link it in this video right here, right now, but if it's not here, it'll be at the very end. Look at it then, okay? Let's move on to the next slide. Short-term high-res models. These models are they model the atmosphere on the storm scale. You can actually see individual storms modeled. So on a dry land day, you can see roughly where storms might actually form later today, and you're going to get a good idea about that. They typically have simulated radar products. Uh, these radar products are fine detail. They can also give you good information on surface feature evolution, etc. On chase day, these are my preferred model. They are modeling the atmosphere on a storm scale, so individual cells are going to be modeled. As a general rule, again, this is something that I repeat many times. Take the output seriously, but always check with the real world to make sure it's not out to lunch and never take it literally. If, a, if the HRR is showing a storm in Kiowa County, Oklahoma, and you go to Kiowa County and the storm actually forms two counties north, that's because you weren't checking the data. And the data is always going to lead you to the storm. If the, I mean, it's just one of those things where a county to three counties off on storm initiation is not crazy. It happens all the time. You got to check satellite. You got to check surface obs. And, and you'll be guided uh, with that. But the big thing I always look at, especially on a dry line type of day or most like storm chase days, is are the models convecting? If all the models are convecting, count on storms. Now, you have to take into account other things to see if that storm's going to be robust. There's uh, the Easter day last year where HRRR and other high-res models were pumping out these supercells in the Texas Panhandle. They looked amazing, but they were not in an environment that favored tornadoes. They were convecting showers along an outflow boundary in an environment very much favorable for tornadoes. And lo and behold, those showers were actually, actually became a supercell by the time storms formed, and you got tornadoes. So... Just remember, you got to fill in the blanks with models. They, they don't tell you everything. So keep that in mind. And obviously, look for consistency. Uh, these high, these short-term high-res models include things like the 3-kilometer NOM, the NSSL WERF, and the HRRR, among others. Or the HER, if you like that. I call it the HRRR, but I guess others call it the HER. Let's not get into that debate right now. So this next slide, we're going to start talking a little bit more practical, a little less theoretical. Every model has its place. That's the title of this slide. They can all be used for different tasks. Every model has different strengths and weaknesses. We talked about that. I'm going to get to some of my preferences in a second as far as what models I use when. Take models seriously, but never literally. Again, I can't stress that point enough. I've said it before, but always, always, always be skeptical of output from models and be asking if it makes sense. This is the best way to live because sometimes models are just going to outright lie to you. Models are liars. They're filthy, dirty, cheating liars, and you never should forget that because as long as you remember that, you're always going to be ready for when they are lying to you and you can be ahead of them. So don't trust models. Just don't. Okay, my preferences when it comes to weather models. Anything out over 10 days. When we're talking, you know, 240 hours or greater, I tend to stick with the GEFS after I look at the Euro. I kind of look at the Euro and how it evolves things in that 10, 
or seven to ten day pattern range, and then I and then I see compare that to the GEFS, see what it's doing, so I can kind of compare notes, and then I tend to look out and you know I check it. I don't have a lot of confidence in my long range forecasting ability at this range, and that's okay. I mean. <laughs> That's a pretty specialized skill that not many people have. So I tend to check my work with the folks at the uh, CPC as well. So if the CPC is showing a wetter pattern and models are kind of showing that, I tend to trust them. They have a better view of the big picture. There's a lot of things that go into long-term forecasting. I am a storm chaser. I'm not a long-term forecaster, but I like seeing, hey, we're going to have a pattern two weeks from now that's going to support storms. And so you, that's about as much as I'll ever get at that range. Once we get to three to 10 days, uh, this is where, you know, setups become a little bit more real to me. Like, okay, there's a trough coming in next week and it looks pretty good. I'm using the Euro and GFS to look at that. I tend to lean on the Euro a little bit more, but I look at the model of those two that has consistency and which ones had the better track record recently. Sometimes the GFS gets on a crazy hot streak and I tend to lean on it a little bit more than the Euro. Sacrilegious, I know. Sometimes it does do pretty well. But that's, you know, a three to 10 day range. That's when you're looking at a setup, you're saying, ah, oh, it's out there. And that's that range where setups tend to go from really good looking to just average or et cetera. So again, see, you're going to see really great setups at this range, especially that seven to 10 day range where you're like, oh, this looks amazing. And by the day of, you're like, what happened? There's veer back everywhere. Moisture has gone to crap. Well, it's because models tend to overestimate there. So just remember that again. In the one to three day range, this is where... Uh, things are starting to change uh, in terms of how I look at models. The NAM has the day in in its eyesight. You also have uh, the Euro I tend to look at and finer details start mattering at this range for chasing. So when I'm, you know, when you're looking one to three days out, you're having to make decisions like this setup looks decent in South Dakota. It looks decent in, say, New Mexico. We can't be in both. We can't hedge. So And we're going to have to choose one to travel to. So which one are we going to choose? And so you got to start actually making real decisions. So I like the NAM, I like the Euro. SRF starts coming into play here, especially on those travel decision days. So at one to three day range, this is where you're starting to make decisions. If it's a obvious Panhandle Oklahoma setup, I tend to just broad brush it all the way to the day of because I'm in Oklahoma. I can get there the day of. I can make the decision in the morning when I wake up. But if it's a Decision that I have to know the night before because we're leaving the night before, you know, obviously we'll start using these models very seriously. And by the time we get the chase day, I'm using the three kilometer NAM, the HRRR and various WERFs. They're my bow. They're my love. I love them. I love all three. I love high resolution models on chase day. Uh, just because I like seeing the fine, as fine a detail as possible. I've never used the GFS on chase day. I rarely if ever use the Euro. I tend to use an aggregate and consistent uh, signals from these models. And obviously, if there's a good consistent signal of convection in northwest Oklahoma, I will then, you know, I'm targeting northwest Oklahoma. And the next thing I do is I pull up satellite and we kind of watch satellite trends and see what happens. And that's how we end up on storms. It's amazing. But um, satellite and mesoanalysis analysis guide you in the rest of the way. That's kind of how I do it. But chase day, I tend to take a look at these models and we adjust from there. I mean, rarely, if ever, will we uh, target just solely on a run of the 3-kilometer NAM or HRRR or something like that. Every now and then, a run of one of these will pump out a storm on a day we weren't expecting storms, and I, it might be enough to get me out of the house. But I don't typically, you know, this isn't something that you just forecast off of. So a few additional pro tips on chasing and models and choosing which ones you want to do. Uh, first thing is don't overwhelm yourself with data. You don't need to see 20 model runs to know what's going on. Keep your workflow simple. It's very easy in this day and age. This used to never be a problem. It used to be you could, uh, you had one or two choices for a model the day of, and you did it, and that's how you forecast, and you were done. Uh, today, it's, you know, you can have anywhere between 20 and 30 models on a chase day, and people will be posting all sorts of crazy stuff on chase day that, you know, the very best run showing the very best up trap to listy track, et cetera. You're going to get a lot of that, and that's because it's just one run of one model. Don't take all this seriously. You're going to have 12 runs of an HRRR that you see before storms ever form, most likely, if you get too crazy, plus the other, you know, uh, 10 or 15 other models that you can look at. So there's so much data. Don't overwhelm yourself. Don't take too much in. 
keep it simple. Keep your workflow simple. Uh, make sure, you know, kind of get a good aggregate of where models are forecasting precip. Use your short term uh, real time information and make your forecast and run with it. That's how you do it. It's very, fairly simple. Storm chasing is not that hard anymore. So the day of, an, of a chase, expect a few runs that are going to be way different too. Uh, HRRR is going to throw out. It, it's almost like clockwork. It's comical how like clockwork it is. HRRR sometime late morning and early afternoon is going to completely flip around and do something completely different half the time. Uh, be it it's going to go from producing a lot of storms to producing no storms or producing no storms to a lot of storms. I mean, it just does these crazy things. Um, that's just what happens when you run a model over and over and over again during the day. You're going to get various outputs. Don't freak out. Look for a reasonable average. Look for the consistency. And this is why I'm hoping the HRF proves very useful later this year because running off every whim of hourly models is just no way to live. I mean... HRRR will oftentimes pump out a run or two every day that looks really amazing, top end of the potential for the day, and it's going to have a couple runs that look terrible and like low end. So you can't run on the whims of, of the HRRR in terms of from run to run. That's no way to live. It's no way to chase. And also, on that note, the long range runs, you can take them seriously, but never take them literally. This is obvious, we talked about it a bit, but maps of specificity of events where systems haven't even been sampled by upper air profiling, the, these are works of fiction by computers. But you'll see people post them and literally like start talking about targeting like Western Kansas eight to nine days from now. This, this isn't how this works. You have big changes from day six or seven to day two or three for the reason that storm systems get sampled by the upper air profiling network and the models then know exactly what the system looks like and then it looks completely different. That's why you had these systems look amazing, like top end, big time, and then all of a sudden it's an average chase day from a week out to two or three days out. And that's why, because it's sampling the system, it's figuring out what's actually going on and then it kind of hits. Accuracy goes way up once that system comes on shore. So just remember, don't take long range runs literally if they're showing a trough you can bet on a trough will that trough be negative tilt and amazing and looking like a five star high risk day we don't know a week out you don't typically know you can there's a lot of times where it looks like that and it ends up average the day up there are a couple of times a year it looks like that and it is that by day one but it's not a it's not a typical thing to have that happen so just remember that play the averages so that's it. We done. That's it for this course. I hope you enjoyed it. We're going to have more on weather models over the next, you know, several months. We'll be hitting on this topic some. Uh, going to hit on soundings a little bit. So we've got a lot of cool stuff coming up. But I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, if you have any questions, ask them in the comments. Have any suggestions for future videos? Make those comments happen. And if you're interested in other courses, you're about to see some here in just one second. We'll see you next time.